Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to the shop. As almost always, I am here with the George Collins. Don't say, don't say it like that. Well, that's how everybody knows you, though. Here's George. what I want to know: What's going on in LA today? There was a uh, little. We had a little mini baby tornado touch down in Montebello, which is a little bit east of here, and do some roof damage. What's going on with the weather? You know, I don't know. maybe it's trying to create some beats. Yeah. Well, as long as as long as it doesn't. Uh, interfere with uh show weekends right? big, show there's days. a big weekend here in uh, southern cal absolutely the uh we're, as we're recording this the uh the wgi west championships in long beach is this weekend it's a it's a uh huge show um i think we're very um we benefit a lot from the fact that the groups from arizona come out uh the groups from northern california come out and Something that that really does, besides just having being able to go to one place and see everybody, is it's really good for all the groups competitively. Yes. Because when you have small shows, sometimes the numbers that the judges give you, um, they, they aren't managed the way they would be if there were more groups. And when there are more groups, you have a little bit of a better sense when you're looking at spreads, when you're looking at what box you, you end up falling into. Um, so it's, a, it's actually like a really big weekend for groups as they make the final push towards, towards Dayton. 100%. Um, and, you yeah. know, since we're in the season, you know, those numbers are starting to come together from all over the country. Yep. You know, the, the, the wide spreads are starting to get to narrow out a little bit and we're getting like a, a better picture on how things are stacking up for, for Dayton. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really exciting. Who, who have you seen that you've liked so far? Like even on videos. Oh man, um, you know I I will say honestly, and and we're talking not Southern California groups, the high schools, them. the high schools, um, Dorman, Dorman for me was Dorman a good one. is yeah. good, um, all those like Milton, Dorman, Lambert, I I really, I don't know who designs for Lambert, but yeah. I really I'm buying what they're selling, yeah. big time, dude, Old Bridge, Old Bridge, yeah, con- and congrats, to, congrats to Old Bridge, and congrats to all the other groups that um, uh, got promoted from open class to world class. Yeah. But old or bridge, do, do they like that word promoted or is it like reclassified? I th- I think I mean I don't know promoted. I, th- I think promoted is a good sort of medium term. Yeah. For it, I feel like they need a cap and gown. You know, like we 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 say you know we just say oh they got bumped they got the bump yeah you know yeah yeah but uh you know and and uh, you know a couple of our groups got promoted Great Oak. High yeah. school and Gar High Gar, School got yeah. promoted from open class to world class. So this is the time of year for all of that. And um, yeah. hey, we took a trip to Houston and yep, Cypher High School got the bump. Yep. Yeah. Speaking of, um, here's what I want to say about Houston. Number one, this is for all. This is for anybody in our audience. There is an open invitation. If we, sh- if Rob and I show up in your lot randomly in some weird part of the country, not weird, in some other part of the country other than Southern California, there's an open invitation to any of you to let us know where to go eat. Yes, because we went to a barbecue place that we thought it was good, but l- later on we this, found out. These are a couple of Southern Californians yeah, yeah. thinking that the barbecue is good. We went to this Texas barbecue place. We're <laughs> like, oh man, this is great. And later on we find out, what did, what did it Taha call it? Yeah. He was like, oh, you guys went to the McDonald's of barbecues. That's uh, like, oh, man. Yeah. And it's like, but it was so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, was a, that was a really, really great trip. Yeah. We basically got to drop into um, that little sort of um, their bubble, like, like the sort of Texas, um, East Texas bubble. Um, which was great. There was, um, I think we felt very welcomed. Yeah. By by all of them. And it was like weird because we went out there and we didn't, we weren't sure like if they'd tell us to beat it or, or whatnot. Yeah. 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 And and it's a it's actually like a really fascinating glimpse into you know sort of how things work there. Um, when you know like when you when you go around the lots in Southern California, you hear a lot of the same exercises and stuff like that because so, you know you can sort of tell where people either performed or taught um, and you see that sort of foundation being laid at the high school level. Same thing happens in Texas. Yes. You know, so, so, you know, we saw Bridgeland and we saw Cypher and they're playing exercises that Monarch's playing. Monarch, yep. And, and we even saw some of the other high schools playing some of like, you know, um, I heard Gallup and I heard like triplet timing and like, you know, things like that. Um, 
So it's, it's really fascinating to see what we see normally in the lots in Southern California, but the Texas version. Yeah. One other thing I want to say, shout out to Monarch, shout out to that staff, shout out to Dre, shout out to Taha, specifically for this reason. I, I told Taha this when, when um, we saw him. Um, I love the way they do stuff. Yep. Um, they, you can tell that they, what is important to them is that they create a culture, n- not really, I wouldn't even call it being laid back. They create a culture of joy. Yes. You know, joy is important to them in doing this thing. It's, it's literally part of their routine, like how they warm up, all of that stuff. Um, and this is why, you know, as, as instructors, as people who are sort of, um, you know, trying to make all these groups work, um, we are in charge. We are basically, you know, um, we have all of these young performers that, um, we're, we're dictating what they do and when a lot of the times. Um, and in, in an, in an activity that's highly repetitive, as repetitive as this, um, the fact that they put a huge importance on a, a, a healthy, joyous mindset means that throughout all of that repetition, while they're trying to get the mechanics correct and, and unified and all of that stuff and habitual, they're also reinforcing all those good feelings. Yep. And that's what I and that is why I love what they what they do and how they do it. I feel like everybody should at least go and, and watch Monarch warm up live mm-hmm. at least one time because it is just such a It's funny an experience. Yes. It's 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 totally an experience. Go sit um, next to Dre. Yeah. And you just have the time of your life. Yeah. yeah. And have have somebody tell you what to say in Yeah. Then. You know, it's like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. You know how there's stuff that yeah. you got to say. Audience participation. Audience participation is, um, is very, it's it's awesome. Yeah. And you know, and, and it's like I understand. We we definitely understand. This can be a very stressful activity. Um, every group has goals. Everybody, every group has a bunch of things they're trying to overcome. Sometimes groups get in the weeds. Um, it's never a reason to really go dark, you know, and. Um, because you, all you have to do is take one or two steps back and go, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, let me, let me exhale and, and sort of recalibrate um, what's important here. Yeah. You know, um, so don't make the kids feel bad while they're drumming. Yeah, yeah. Even, also, even if that's what it takes to make them drum well, figure out another way. Yeah, you know. we, we we talked Monarch, but also I want to give a shout out to the, the Rhythmic Force people. Rhythmic Force. Gave me great access. UTSA. U- UTSA. Yeah, Bridgeland. Yep. Cypher. We're yeah. sorry that we couldn't get, get everybody, get yeah. around to everybody, but... Um, we're, it, kind of, we're kind of feeling our way around there, too, at I the mean, same time. Yeah. yeah. Just so. basically being like, who's that? Yeah. You know, they sound pretty good. Yeah. And then that sun, that Texas sun. Yeah, we, we came from like rainy, you know... Uh, uh, weird LA weather to like it's 80 degrees we're wearing shorts you ever see that like and I, I got this like in San Antonio too that Mario Brothers son the one that's trying to kill yep, you yep. that's exactly that's, that's what it felt like that's the Texas son to me yeah so but hey let's get into to talking about our guest absolutely. go ahead George go absolutely ahead. so um, a lot of people are going to recognize our guest immediately if you um, and and for many different reasons um Number one, if you, you know, were a tenor drummer or have been a tenor drummer the last 10, 12 years coming up, um, this person has probably impacted you this per- either directly or indirectly. Just, just what were you going to say? I was going to say not only that, this person's like the triple threat, you know, mm-hmm. teaching, performing. You Absolutely. Know. Like most people will recognize him as a, as a performer and an instructor, both at Blue Devils and RCC. Uh, this summer, he's going to be teaching Blue Stars. Oh, he also teaches Arcadia High School. Yeah. But this is the thing I want to say about our guest, and I'm going to embarrass him a little bit. I got I got one thing to say yeah. to you. This is one of the few people in the history of the activity to make that transition from tenor to snare mm-hmm. at the highest level. Absolutely. I could think of one other person Absolutely. from our era. But um, yeah. So the this is what I'm going to say about this person. Um, I've mentioned before that I... Um, uh, I teach, I, I give lessons and stuff like that. And a lot of the stuff I do is audition prep. Um, something that I'm very mindful of is that in Southern California, especially that we basically teach as a community, right? So kids have 
one teacher in high school, and then they and then after that they go around to different groups, and they get um, information and and we basically uh, um, not pass these students around, but each of us gets time in front of them at a certain time or uh, you know for a certain amount of time. What I think about you know while uh, when somebody comes to me and they say I want to make this group, I want to make that group. What I think about is. I get very focused on, let me just get them to the place where they can then have the opportunity to learn from this person. And um, our guest today is one of those people that I'm like, all I want is for you to be able to learn from this person. So let's bring Nick Arce. Welcome to the shop, Nick. Welcome to the shop. Thanks, guys. That was really nice of you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so... uh you're here with us today, and uh, are you a Southern California guy? Mm-hmm. Where did whereabouts did you grow up? Coachella Valley. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's in Coachella the uh, that's the desert area, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Like, uh, is it like Palm Springs, Indio area? Yeah, Palm Springs, Indio, La Quinta, Coachella. So, about how far from the L.A. area is that? It's about two hours. In in, in miles, what would you say? What about 120 miles? miles? Do we um, talk in miles anymore? It's I don't like, know. We always, we always, it's time. Southern California I'd people, say, it's always yeah, time. It's, yeah. it's like, how long does it take to, to get somewhere? Yeah. But now, even in time, it's like with the traffic and everything, it's, it's all different. So, yeah. 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 But um, I mean, and something we were talking about offline is that that area has, since we were young, you know, has been, has always been a hotbed of, um, you know, for the activity, it's always produced really great players. Had some really good teachers and stuff out there. Yeah, um, the the Johnny Ortiz yep. taught lines from back in the the eighties and nineties, the Coachella Valley and Indio lines. Um, what got you started? How, what was your? We always loved that. We always loved the. What was your first you know exposure was to it, it, and what was that like? Was it like a mixtape or what was it? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, my cousin Marge Blue Devils, uh, he was in the color guard. Okay. And <clears throat> when visiting him, I think in like eighth grade, he taught me how to play paradiddles and flams. Like he also drummed too. Okay. Um, and so that was my first exposure, like him teaching me some rudiments. Yeah. I'd played drum set, you know, like in elementary, middle school. Um, so that was really my first start in drumming. My brother taught me how to play drum set, kept doing that for a while. Uh, but my cousin is the one who taught me some rudiments and showed me some Blue Devils videos. And I didn't. Really and what, what, what was that like? Yeah. What, I, well, what era did he march in? He marched in mid nineties. Mid nineties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't really know what it was. It was, <laughs> it was just marching band to me. You know, yeah. I was a kid. Um, but how old were you then? I was uh, eighth grade. Was that like twelve? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay. Yeah. And so, he taught me some stuff, and I was like, "Hey, you should probably check out your drum line, like in high school." And then my older brothers, they were in high school, and they said it was a cool thing, and so I checked it out and uh, I actually came in late I came in during band camp and the line was already set um, so they were like hey you're gonna have to join the pit it's like all right cool don't know what that is <laughs> <laughs> and so I did about a day of band camp and uh, I remember not wanting to do it it's like I'm not gonna do this thing like this really? is weird and like was, was it like too long go skate and yeah. play drum set you know oh. it wasn't it it was just different like I had no idea what it was I didn't know anybody um, and my mom actually talked me into staying. She's like, give it a couple of weeks. I was like, okay. So I stayed and it was really cool. Just met some cool people who were very open to teaching me like anything on the spot. Um, and I just stuck around, stayed in the pit for that year, but was able to drum with the quad section leader. And he was very open to just helping me out with anything. Like every day at lunch, he would drum with me <laughs> and like teach me warm ups, teach me book. And so that's really what uh, got me drumming. So who, who was he and who, who was teaching the, the program at the time? So this is at La Quinta High School. I went to La Quinta High School. I uh, graduated in 2008. And this quad section leader was this guy named Nathan. Mm-hmm. Uh, he actually marched Yamato, I think, in 08. Um, and so he's the one who taught me uh, a lot of like beginning stuff. And Johnny, who you mentioned, Johnny Ortiz, he was the percussion caption head at the time. And Javi Ortega and Mike Burek, they were our instructors. Mm-hmm. 
they were the the snare instructors, but they kind of worked with everybody. You know, that's just how they did things back then. And Corin Hendricks, I don't know if you guys know him. He marched quads mm -hmm. for a while. He also did RCC, played bass. Okay. Um, but yeah, he was our quad tech that year, and. I didn't directly work with him until my sophomore year. Um, so yeah, Nathan was the main guy, you know, in the line just showing me stuff. So, so it's his fault. It's his fault. So <laughs> like, like what year was this? This was, was that 04? 04? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if you guys know who Jeremy Summers is, he was a senior when I was a freshman. Okay. I've heard the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's go way back in 2004. <laughs> so, um, that's that's amazing. You started off in the pit, you know, um, but you know the 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 older kids they saw a little something in you, they and they they got you got you on the path. Um, the and but before that, you knew about this sort of blue devils thing, right? In this this greater world, um, but kind of as you described it, it kind of sounds like you still weren't sure about it, you know. Was there a moment, you know, was there a moment during high school where you were like, oh, no, wait, actually, this is something I really like. And this is something. Was there like a show do. that you saw or a drum line that you saw that like got you really hooked? Yeah. So I think it was, where was that? Oh, I think it was the Manifest Destiny show, the 05 RCC show. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to see it and Javi was in it and he was my instructor. He also went to Indio and La Quinta High School. Mm -hmm. And um, that was my first like connection to it. I was like, oh, this instructor is doing this thing and he's performing at this really high level. And it was just really cool to see it. You know, I was like, like, what is this? It was indoor, it yeah. wasn't drum corps, it was different. Yeah. Uh, but the performance aspect, like, I didn't know anything still about drumming. It's like, I don't know what they're playing. <laughs> but, but it was just so cool. And to see someone who worked with me every day you know, performing uh, at a really high level. And it was really inspiring and in trying to do that. When did you decide that you wanted like to play quads? Was it your sophomore year that you got started doing that or? That was my freshman year uh, while I was in the pit, Nathan played quads and I just, I don't know, they just looked cool. And I think, cause I played drum set. It's like, oh, I want to play that drum cause yeah. it's kind of like it, but it's, it's nothing like it. <laughs> and so, uh, he worked with me and taught me some stuff and um, Jeremy, you know, because he was on snare his senior year, but he's also a quad player, right? He just played snare his senior year, um, kind of as a battery section leader. And he lent me a quad pad, and he also started drumming with me a lot during my freshman year. And, um, yeah, I think I just started doing it because him and Scott Nelson, who he was also a freshman, mm -hmm. my same age as me, he was in the quad line already, and him and Jeremy would drum a lot, and it just looked cool, whatever they were playing. Uh, and so I was like, I want to learn that stuff. It just looked fun to play. I didn't think about like marching. I didn't think yeah, about yeah. like a show. It's like, I just want to play whatever they're playing because it looked cool. Yeah, right. And so people just taught me some stuff. That's cool. What, what was the next level that you did besides high school? What was that next level group? I did Impulse in 06. 06? Let's go. Yeah, so that yeah. was my sophomore to junior year. <laughs> and and, and what, got you, what got you there? Was it somebody say, hey, I'm going to go to this audition? Do you want to go or... Yeah, it's kind of funny. So in 2006, or to that audition season, so 05, um, we're just drumming. At this point, I'm a sophomore. I uh, made the quad line, and we're drumming, and Johnny comes around. He's, he's asking us because it's about to be audition season. He's like, where are you auditioning? And everyone's like, Esperanza, Esperanza. Mm -hmm. It gets to me. I don't know what he's talking about. It's like, Esperanza. <laughs> and so, um, he walks away. I was like, what? what's that? You know, <laughs> Where are you guys going? Yeah. And so... Uh, Jeremy drove up a few people and I hopped in the car and went with them to Esperanza auditions. Had no idea what to expect. Um, Miguel was the quad tech at this time. Did an individual with him. He asked me to play some things and I was like, oh, Jeremy taught me this thing. Played it, completely broke. <laughs> and then, yeah, you know, I got put into group B and uh, I got to see other kids my age who were way better than me. Um, and it, it didn't shut me down. It was exciting. It was like, oh, part of me was like, oh, thank God. In group B, some people who, you know, my level, but they weren't, they were still way better than me. Uh, but it was fun to see. And so after that, going home, it's like, okay, there's a lot more to this thing. And I just kept drumming and learned about Impulse, learned about Yamato, other groups, and kind of went out to 
audition for a couple and Corin was our quad tech in high school and he was also the quad tech at impulse and so that just seemed like the most natural thing to do and so uh, auditioned at impulse and yeah made it who was who was yeah. running impulse at the time who was the caption that was ike Oh, Ike okay. And um, Ken McGrath. Yeah, okay. I think Ken yep. wrote. Hmm. What What year was that? 2006. Okay. Mm-hmm. McConnell was there, snare tech, and then Corn was a quad tech, and Matt Norm was a bass tech. Did you Did you Did you learn a lot during your time at Impulse? Uh, yeah, more so just like the pure exposure of being in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say like, yeah, I took away this and this and this. It was just. A very hard summer. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you're just immersed in that whole thing. Yeah. For- and it, it, I mean, that's what everybody goes through. Yeah. Right. It's like no matter what, if you've never done it before, doing a summer of drum gore is hard. Yes. It, just because it's specific, you know, and the energy you need to have and the focus you need to have and what you're being asked to do, it's brand new. Don't know how to do it. You're not good at it yet. So you just kind of survive, right? That 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 first year. Well, there, there's even levels of doing drum gore. There's like doing like Mm-hmm. The luxury level of drum corps, and then there's like the grind level of of drum corps. I'm yeah. taking it was impulse like the grind level of drum corps back then. Like I think so, at yeah. least from a member standpoint. Com- like compared to going. compared to other places that you've marched, was it like more of a grind than? Yeah, I think because yeah. they had to, right? It's yeah. like you don't have that talent level to just like, all right, guys, we're doing this, yeah. and then they just do it. It's like you kind of got to force them to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So, how long were you there at, at, at Impulse? I did Impulse for two years, yeah. 06, 07. Did the line, was the line like better than the second year that you were there? Or? It was a staff change in 07. Okay. Uh, Nico came in. Nico came in. Yeah. yeah. And was writing and was the caption head. Um, yeah. So I stayed and it was fun. It was fun. I was definitely more aware and, you know, just knowing what I was getting myself into. And yeah, had a, had a good time and still learned a lot and got some more exposure to just some mechanical things. And then you're like in high school at this time. So whatever you learned there, you took back to your high school and were you like, hey, check this out. Yeah. And, I, you know, we were fortunate to have Jeremy go back and teach us in high school. Um, and at that time, he was marching Esperanza. Uh, he made RCC. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did RCC 06 to 2010. He did Blue Devils of 708. And so during this whole time, he's coming back, you know, from RCC rehearsal after a summer and he's just teaching us all the quad breaks and exercises and, um, yeah, any kind of book stuff. And so we were very fortunate to have uh, Jeremy, who was just teaching us little things, giving us little nuggets at a time. And that it's really, it kind of worked in the opposite way for me, where rather than bringing things from drum corps to high school, I was taking a lot of things that Jeremy taught me right. into drum corps. Well, um, let me ask you this, because I think, you know, La Quinta High School, your generation, um, there's, there's, it's, it's, I don't want to say like it's famous, but people know it for producing, you know, consistently producing good talent for a while, right? Um, when you think back to, uh, and maybe it was just by doing, maybe it was just because he was bringing the material back and, 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 and showing you how to work it and all of that stuff, but was there something else foundationally where they, you know, all of them were instilling in you, here's what's important about how to do this, you know? Um, when you think back, can you remember any of that at all? Like, or, or was it just, let's play these beats and, and learn by doing, you know? I think it was a, it was a good mix of things, you know? Um, Javi and Mike uh, ran the battery back then, and they're very structured, uh, just in terms of, you know, basic protocol stuff. And I think that helped us stay a little bit more engaged, a little bit more aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, the balance of having staff who was very engaged and very hungry to like teach and they were young and they were still doing it. And then you had us who were students who just wanted to learn. And I think when those two things happen, like some very cool things can be produced, right. you know? And so, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And we always pushed each other. You know, the quads, uh, it was me, Scott Nelson, and Andrew Verdusco. Um, and we, you know, as you guys know, or if you know, we marched RCC and Blue Devils together, and we went to high school together, and we always just drummed. 
you know, that was just what we did at lunchtime. We were drumming after school. We were drumming. And it was it was competitive, but we were always teaching each other things. Like, hey, check this out. I learned this. Like, learn it with me. Let's drum it. Mm-hmm. You know, and the staff was the same way after rehearsal. It was pretty common that we would stay an hour after rehearsal. Um, even if we were going till 9, we'd stay till 10 and just drum. Did you guys, like, go out and, like, kill every other high school line at the time that was in, like... <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Indio was pretty pretty good back really? then too because mike and hobby were also over there yeah. yeah all those guys were still yeah. over there and um a lot of them like anthony and uh, amador they they went on and marched did you guys have like that competitiveness with each other like that rivalry um yeah but we we're also friends like yeah. i think it started that way of like all of these guys indio and then we got to know them it's like oh these guys are cool it's like yeah, yeah. let's drum <laughs> i think when people think about you nick like when when people think about like nick rc not like the sort of Mick RC, right? The known uh, quantity. One of the things, one of the things I'm I'm willing to bet people would say is that you make stuff look easy. It's just as just as like a general impression. Um, in high school, what did you struggle with? Like in in trying to do this thing, was there anything for, that you specifically, when you were given this stuff to do, where you were like, man? This for me, very specifically, is difficult. Um, or, or again, were you not even thinking about that? Was it just like you know? Was there anything that was particularly um, a challenge for you? Um, roles, <laughs> roles were pretty hard. Uh, I think everyone can agree with that. Like that's something that you continually work on, even when you're at the highest level. Um, but I specifically remember roles being something that I just could not dial in on. Specifically, tap roles. Was it like, was it feel? Was it the sound? Was it what, what, what was the thing that you were like? Oh, that's was, not it. Was it like diddle quality? It was or just what? rhythmic accuracy. Rhythmic. Like, oh, really? <laughs> it was really hard for me. Yeah, um, and I'm not sure why, you know. But I will say something that, you know, even you say making it look easy. That was, that was really because of Jeremy preaching efficiency, even at, for us at the high school level, um, and that was something I always thought about, and so when I would get book or something that I couldn't really do, um, it kind of came natural to me and I didn't really realize what I was doing in, in creating my own primers back in high school. I wasn't uh, repping book all the time. I mean, yeah, I'd practice the book, but I wasn't just running it down. Um, I was uh, not sure why, but I was able to like identify parts that were difficult and then work on a skill set. You know, and, I, and at that time, I wouldn't identify as a skill set. I would just like this part of this paradiddle is really hard, so I would just try that and practice that a bunch. Um, would you I think that helped? Would you break it down to like check pattern? Um, yeah, like let's say a paradiddle part was difficult. I would I would know that that downstroke is hard, but I wouldn't identify it as a downstroke. It's like oh, downstrokes are hard for me. It's like it's like this part of the paradiddle. <laughs> you know, I didn't know exactly what it was. You know, as a sophomore. Or, even as a junior sometimes, um, just trying to figure it out and, and piece it together that way. So, that, I mean, and, and so, you, like, even back then, like, facing those challenges, your mind was already working to essentially solve those puzzles, right? Like, how do I, how do I tackle this, right? And you had, some, you had some really good guidance. You said the word efficiency, and I think, I think you know, especially because, you know, Jeremy, Jeremy was a tenor player. You came up playing tenors. Efficiency is something that a lot of battery, I mean, I'm sure all, you know, marching percussion, they really care about, but it's especially important for tenor drummers, right? Yeah. Like, um, why, right? Like, I, I, I sort of have some insight into why, but can you explain why that becomes such a focus for you? I think, so, to kind of back up, um, well, it's kind of coupled with efficiency is motion. Mm-hmm. And I say, I use those two words a lot. And, you know, within a season, we're defining it and refining it and making connections and associations to it so that the members can interpret what we're saying better. And, um, yeah, it is very important as a quad player because that motion has effort and intensity levels within whatever it is that you're playing. And I think, you know, quad drumming has you know shifted throughout the years from before me to when I was in it to now Mm -hmm. and the way that students use motion I think is 
pretty different now. Yeah. And a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And so fluidity is like this umbrella word that just, you know, who knows how kids are thinking about it today. But, uh, when I was in high school and, and marching and playing quads, um, efficiency and motion was very, um, it was fluid, but it had, it had purpose and structure behind it. It wasn't just like stay floppy and loose and go, <laughs> you know? And I think that that's what, in, what's interpreted from the outside. Um, but everything is very identified. Um, and I remember in 2011 devs, that was something that we did a lot of where we were playing a part and we would identify the rate of travel for like every little thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a big part of, you know, the intensity or effort of motion and where it was placed. And I think that's what creates that look from the outside of effortlessness or efficiency. Um, and kind of done through uh, the macro mechanics of motion and the micro mechanics of kind of what you're doing uh, with the stick. Something that that I've really because I'm not a tenor drummer, right? Um, but when I you know when I would look over to that that part of the line, um, I remembered what they looked like when I marched, you know, like with when Sean Vega was in the line and stuff like that, and guys like Rudy. And I remember how that changed mm-hmm. when Miguel was in the line, you know, instead of being so crouched over the drums. <laughs> All of a sudden, the tenor drummers were, you know, chests were up, chins were up, um, real, real closed in, just right. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I remember because 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 you know sometimes people send us arch- archival footage, <laughs> or you know, um, and I remember specifically somebody had sent us some mid two thousands uh, videos, and what I noticed was there was a real shift in the mid two thousands in terms of the fluidity. Right. And because I would say before that there was real sort of power through the space. Everything was very high velocity, high intensity and just power, like delivering a lot of power to the drums. Um, All of a sudden, like 2006, you know, um, I was watching the tenors and going, that looks different. Right. There's something how they're moving around the drums is different. Like there's a there's a different idea that's trying to be manifested there. The reason why I said in the intro, I feel like you've impacted, you know, a bunch of tenor drummers um, is because what may have started sort of in the mid 2000s, I feel like was maybe if not fully like best realized and demonstrated during your era, you know, as like as as a as a peak tenor, tenor drummer, as like an example of like when people talk about efficiency of movement, um, and motion and all of that, that here's a, here's a, here's a really strong reference for that, you know? Um, but that just doesn't, you know, what we're, the whole, the whole point of this conversation is, um, that takes time. It takes seasons. That's something that evolves. And, and, and it's not like an instant, like somebody popped out and just, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, is that, is that something that Vega wanted to evolve the, you know, movement and everything like that? Or was that like, through the members, I think it's I think it's both for sure. Like the people who are in front of the quad line, um, you know, preaching however they want to move around the drums, and those quad members who have the opportunity to be there for two, three, four years. Uh, the one the one and done, like you come in and you're out. That it's hard to make a shift in how you're drumming. And so, yeah, like Vega was in there for a while. Right. Rudy was in there for a while. Miguel was in there for a while. Mm-hmm. Tim was in there for a while. Mm-hmm. Like we were in there for a while. And so I think we've all just had that time and opportunity to make those micro adjustments to what came before us. Um, but definitely uh, the 06 quad line is something that I held to a standard, you know, for a long time when I was in it. Like, so oh, I'm not crazy. This way. No. I'm not crazy in noticing what I, in, in noticing no. what I noticed. I think, I think if you ask a lot of, um, you know, quad drummers from, my generation, they'll say the 06 quad line is like their favorite quad line. I think a lot of kids now, who knows that they even watch videos that go back to that, to 06. So like, what's the oldest video you watched? They're like 2014. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> it's kind of, uh, I think it's more of our generation that looked at those videos and thought that was standard. Who did Jeremy learn from at Esperanza? Miguel. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So that so it was a lot of that that he was bringing back. Oh yeah, 
to you guys. Mm-hmm. A lot of, I think that's what's different to you. So like Miguel looks different uh, than say, you know, the nineties. And I think a lot of that is just how he incorporated like using everything mm-hmm. and not just like pull back and, and, you know, make it happen. Well, I'm sure his personality. <laughs> I mean, yeah, literally like, that too, yeah. <laughs> like if, if anybody's hands uh, gave you a window into their personality, <laughs> yeah. that's, you know, it's, and it's and that's we we've talked about that on previous previous episodes. It's like your hands tell a story. Mm-hmm. You know, there's very much of your your identity and person not identity, but your personality in terms of like it, it can't help but get in there yeah. in terms of in terms of how you play. Yeah, that's funny. Um, after two years of impulse, you still haven't graduated high school yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you graduated in 08. Mm-hmm. So then you do mystical. Mystical. <laughs> Can we talk about mystical? Dude, this sounds like no. <laughs> if, I, if, if I hear mystical, I think of the rapper. From I know. Like, when, like when we when we looked it up, we were like mystical, the mystical, rapper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a lot of good people mm-hmm. went through there. What was going? What was? Well, first off, where were they based out of? That's a little. They were a little drum corps, correct? They were a little drum corps. <laughs> 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 yeah, they were like. Well, it, who knows how it started? But it ended with like seven horns and mm-hmm. thirty guard and like. Where was it based out of? Uh, we rehearsed in Long Beach. I think, I don't know on paper where they're based out of, mm-hmm. but we rehearsed in Long Beach at some random parks. And But see, this is <laughs> this is what people need to understand. It's not always about the big cores that you're with. You, you start somewhere small mm-hmm. and you work your way, you know, you get mm-hmm. to that to that end point. It's not, you, you don't always need to just start like, I'm, a, I'm Blue Devils in, or, or nothing, you know. You went there, Scott went there, mm-hmm. Andrew. Andrew went there. And Vanessa. And Vanessa. Vanessa Van Amador. And Amador. <laughs> and Amador. Um, what, what took you guys there? Why, why mystical? Um, so Ike was there. Okay. And at that time, he was teaching a lot of us, whether it be in high school or from another drum corps. And he kind of just recruited a few of us. And then we kind of talked to people like, hey, come, come to mystical. And so we kind of just word of mouth, put a line together and went and auditioned together and yeah, so it was really big to start. It was like ten snares, five bass, five cymbals, mm-hmm. five quads, and I think it ended with like three or four bass drums, three cymbals, uh, four quads, and three snares. <laughs> yeah, we we saw, we uh, we dug up some old yeah. some old videos of it. Who was in the? Do you remember? Was Matt Padilla in that scene? He was. Let's he was. go. Yeah, <laughs> I thought I recognized him. That's great. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, like, okay, so we're joking about it, but yeah. was that a hard summer? Was it a was it a good summer? Was it what was going on? Was it a full tour? Or was it like just it was a half tour? a tour? And um, you know, I don't I don't want to say too much about what that summer was, <laughs> just because it was it was tough from a logistical standpoint, yeah. and you know, the parents who were there were trying their best, um, but you know, it turned into something where you know. 99% of the staff left and the students were just left to, you know, our wow. own, our own rehearsals. And, like hunger games. Oh yeah. Like Matt Padilla <laughs> actually like wrote the closer cause you know, yeah. we lost all staff wow. <laughs> and we still went and just made it, just made it fun. You know, we, we played exercises that we wanted to play. They just turned into this completely different thing. Right. Um, and I, if you ask every everyone who was in it, they'd all probably say, like, yeah, it was really fun, but I, I would not do that yeah. if I go back. Was it a one-and-done season for that? Oh, yeah. 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 I, I believe they folded, like, the next year, um, but I'm not sure. Don't, don't quote yeah. me on that. Was it important to go through a season like that? Because it sounds like, for the most part, um, uh, everywhere that you had been before, I mean, it was, like, at least in high school and stuff, um, Things were taken care of, right? Um, but then you go to a situation where there's a lot of chaos. I mean, we know what that's like. We marched VK. Like that was, in, in our era, that was like, they had their own version of being a small core that had things to figure out logistically. And there was a bunch of chaos and a bunch of stuff where you feel like as a member, man, I'm working so hard. And there are all these things that are impacting my experience that have nothing to do with me, completely out of my control. And they're negative, you know? Was... Did that, I mean, I'm sure maybe you didn't, but maybe in hindsight, looking back on it, um, were you like, want to make sure, you know, 
I don't find myself in that situation again, but also if I ever go on to teach, I want to make sure that, you know, if I have anything to say about it, that, that, that situation doesn't happen, happen to any group that I teach. Right. I, I think, um, we all kind of knew we chose this situation. Mm. <laughs> it's like, Oh, we chose to be here. Like, you know, the quad line, a lot of us auditioned at PC. I mean, Scott and Amador marched PC in 07. Uh, me and Andrew marched Impulse in 07. Um, Vanessa came from Esperanza, mm -hmm. and we all went to Mystical. <laughs> you know, and so we chose that so we could all drum together. Yeah, right, right, right. and because you want to drum with your friends. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's what it kind of came down to, where we changed quad parts to whatever we wanted to change it to. Um, you know, as everything was dwindling down. It's like, hey, we're still playing this book. Like, let's just have fun. Was it some ridiculous book by the end? You know, just uh, it wasn't. It wasn't too crazy, but yeah. it was enough to to keep us busy. That's cool. Yeah, and we still, you know, Scott and I flew out to Indy to do our INEs, and we were able to to uh, watch Jeremy age out, and yeah, it was cool. How did Scott like have like a full beard? <laughs> He was a senior, right? Yeah. He looked like, a, he, looked like he was like Pretty 25. Pretty sure he had a full beard since he was like in fifth grade. <laughs> <laughs> One of those types, yeah. 